Welcome back to Gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp. With me today is Steve Hoffman, also known as Captain Hoff, and you'll find out why he calls himself Captain Hoff here in a few. But here's a bit about Steve. Steve Hoffman, Captain Hoff, has had more careers than cats have lives, from Hollywood TV executive and game designer to man manga rewriter, voice actor, animator, electrical engineer, studio head, and video game designer. Today, he's the captain and CEO of Founder Space, one of the world's leading startup accelerators. Founder Space was ranked the number one incubator for overseas startups by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazines. Hoffman is also a venture investor, founder of three venture back and two bootstrap startups, and author of several award-winning books. These include Make Elephants Fly, published by Hackache, Surviving a Startup, published by Harper Collins, and The Five Forces, published by Ben Bella. He also has some other things that he is doing in and behind the scenes. So without further ado, please welcome Captain Hoff. Genesis, it's fantastic to be here. My pleasure. So Steve, go ahead and tell the listeners and viewers a little bit more about yourself because we all know that a bio is just a bio and you are multifaceted and multidimensional and you've been, I think, around the world and back virtually as well as non-virtually. <laughs> That's true. I have spent, you know, before COVID, I was spending 70% of my time traveling. So all across Asia, all across Europe, South America. And I was working with entrepreneurs in all those countries, hundreds of entrepreneurs. So I run Founder Space. It's a global startup incubator and accelerator. But I've also been an entrepreneur my entire life. In fact, I've done two bootstrap startups and three venture funded startups in Silicon Valley. And I love every minute of it. And I want to share some of what I've learned with your audience. Awesome sauce. And I'm just so awesome. Awesomely grateful that you are going to be here and y'all don't judge me. Awesomely grateful may not be <laughs> the best of words, but that's how excited I am to talk to Steve, aka Captain Hoff. And today we're going to discuss the secrets of the indestructible entrepreneur. And the reason why this is so important is right now we're in this period called the great resignation, where you see hundreds of employees are walking out on their employers because they are just fed up and they feel like if I could spend this amount of time and energy building someone else's brand, empire, and legacy, why not do it for myself? So when you hear the term, um, Captain Hoff, the great resignation, and you see what's going on in the media as well as behind the scenes, and with you being an entrepreneur, how does that speak to you? I love it. So I've always been resigning. Like it's been... You know, I've had a lot of different jobs, but every time I get into a job, I usually barely last a year and then I'm off to some other venture that I am starting up. So, you know, I began my career in film and television. I worked my way up to TV development executive. After a year, I jumped ship. I went to Japan. I made video games uh, for one of the largest Japanese game companies, jump ship, and then started my own game company. And I just kept going company after company. So when Entrepreneurs do this, I, I applaud them, but I also, especially in my latest book, Surviving a Startup, I want to give them advice because honestly, you can jump ship, but you, you better do your homework because most startups fail. It's just a fact, the majority fail. So if you wanna be an indestructible entrepreneur, how do you win? How do you take your idea and actually get it off the ground? And then whenever you say, take your idea and get it off the ground, I want you to talk about the difference between bootstrap 
and startups because sometimes people try to merge the two but in your definition since you have been successful at both despite the failures and the reason why I say despite the failures it's because the failures that happen to us also happen for us because there's a lesson that each one of us is meant to learn in failing and it gives us you know enough insight knowledge to know don't do that again because when you did this it did not work so try it a different way so let's talk about that so bootstrap startups are basically when you start them with your own money with whatever resources you have and your sweat equity what can you put into this company to actually get it going it comes from the term of lifting yourself up by your own boots which if you could imagine is quite a challenge uh, so bootstrap startups, almost every startup begins as a bootstrap startup. A few get funding right away, um, but a f the lucky few actually uh, achieve something along the way of bootstrapping. So they figure out how to develop a business with a business model that has potential for extremely rapid growth. Now, venture capitalists, when you get venture funding for a startup, and I did three of those, Venture capitalists are really selective. It seems like they're throwing money at everything, but they're actually looking very carefully at what the startup has achieved and what its future potential is. And I will tell you, 97% of the startups out there right now, startup ideas, will not get venture funding. And they probably don't deserve to get venture funding. So you have to analyze what type of business you have. So most businesses are really better off just focusing on bootstrapping it, just focusing on funding it themselves and growing it through revenue. For example, if you're a consulting business, the chance of getting a venture capitalist to fund you is almost zero. <laughs> most consulting businesses, the, the reason is they're hard to scale. They're hard to grow because as a single consultant, of course, you, you're limited by your time. So the only way to do more consulting is to bring on more people. But how do you find the people with the talents that you have or the special talents that your customers need? That is tough. And it's even tougher now in the age of the great resignation because most of the, the most talented people that could be working for you as consultants, well, they're off working for themselves as consultants. So consulting business is really hard. Small restaurant, really hard. You know, a lot of different businesses you run, they're more lifestyle businesses. They can feed you and your family. They can do, you could do pretty well. You could make six, seven figures in these companies. But for a company to be venture fundable, you literally have to be the type of company that's going to become a unicorn, a billion dollar company. And you need to get there quickly, not linear growth, but exponential growth. And then so whenever you think about the businesses that you started and then that you got venture capital, what did you have to have in place before you acquired that venture capital? And then another question to that, um, Steve, is whenever you went out to seek that venture capital, did you have a coach or a mentor that guided you along or did you do it all yourself? I wish I had a coach when I started with my first venture funded company. It was brutal. So we started the company and we had this, uh, our first vision, we had this massively multiplayer online gaming engine. And we thought we're going to sell this to game developers. And we went out there and we found out the game developers weren't going to pay us anything. It was in the early days, you know, you know, many years ago. And they, it was too early. The game developers weren't ready for it. They didn't care to have multiplayer games. They didn't see the value. And the few who saw the value wanted to give us very little money. So we pivoted again. We did this plug-in to websites that enabled game and chat at the same time. This was when the first browser plugins ever developed. We won the South by Southwest competition. We had hundreds of websites using our product, yet we had no way to make money. It was the early days of the internet. Internet advertising wasn't here yet. We actually plugged internet ads into our application and we got like not even enough money to buy pizza. So we were desperate. So we're running out of time. We're running out of money bootstrapping this. We uh, hear that MTV and Viacom wanted to develop interactive TV. So we said, okay, we'll take our platform and we'll approach them. We actually got them to buy into the platform. We, and, we, and we were gonna launch with MTV the first and the biggest on-air, online 
interactive TV show called Web Riot. Now, we got $350,000 from them, which to us seemed like a huge amount of money. We're still bootstrapping it because when you're bootstrapping it, it means you're getting money from customers and they were our customers. So we had $350,000. We started building out the platform. Everything seemed great, except that it costs a lot to build out a platform and we needed more money. So I was going out at the same time to raise venture capitals. And I didn't know anybody at the time, not like today where I know hundreds of, of investors in Silicon Valley and even more overseas. But at that time, I didn't know them. So I was knocking on doors. I you know most people wouldn't respond. It was really, really difficult. I was talking to angels, trying to convince them. And I learned along the way just how tough it is. Let me tell you, there was one angel investor who seemed to love what we had. And he was constantly coming back to us and asking questions and more information. And every time I gave him more information, I thought, wow, he's going to invest. But you know what? He never did. <laughs> he never invested. So the, the thing I learned here is that if somebody isn't willing to commit right away when you engage them, I mean, after two or three meetings, just tell them you can't meet them anymore. Because what it does is it gives you false hope. And really, the people who are going to invest, they're not looky-loos, they're just looking, but they, they aren't really serious about investing. The ones who are going to invest, they commit usually after three or four meetings. It doesn't take more than that. And if they haven't committed after three or four, they're probably never going to commit. So you should walk away. But I engaged with this angel and a number of other VCs for like nine months. None of them ever invested. I wow. finally, yeah, it's brutal. Finally, I got a VC firm in Los Angeles made up the big Hollywood executives who said they would invest. And I literally, I went to a, 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 a big law firm to do all the legal work because I didn't know how to do it. And I ran up $60,000 in legal bills. We negotiated the whole contract, right? Every I dotted, T crossed, everything ready to sign. We're sitting down. I said, okay, let's sign the deal. We need the money. They were going to give us $5 million at a $15 million pre-money valuation. Really good deal. And you know what they said? I, we want to wait. We decided we want to wait until your product launches. We want to see if your product is successful. So you asked me, like, what does it take to get funding? Like, I'm like, we have a deal with MTV and Viacom. You should be, you know, we, you, we agreed you would fund us. No, we want to wait. So what could I do? We had to wait two months. And so we waited two months, the product launched, boom, it was a huge success, like a huge success. A million users signed up. And in those early days of the internet, that was just enormous. We had on-air broadcasts across the entire MTV network. We, you know, we, we were doing incredibly well. I went back to them, but the only problem was we had no money now. We had spent everything to get to this point. We go back to them and said, okay, we really need the money now. Like our product launched, it was successful write the check. You know what they said? They told us, yeah, we'll write the check, but at half the valuation we promised you. Half. They were going to cut our value down in half after we launched successfully. Wow. That's Br crazy. Brutal, right? So <laughs> this is what it takes. You're like, oh my God. So I have a choice between walking away from you and literally, it's, it's just about Thanksgiving. And between Thanksgiving and mid-January, all the venture capitalists go home. They, they don't write checks. They're like off doing their thing. So, you know, there's all the holidays and everything. So we could walk away from you and try to get another VC, but it's not going to come for at least six or seven weeks. Or we could take your money, but you guys are evil. <laughs> like you, you, you screwed us over. What do we do? You know what we did? We walked. We said, you know, screw you. We don't want you on our board. We don't want you as our partner. You guys, we don't want to be in business with you. We don't even want to talk to you if you're going to play dirty like this. We are walking away. So we walked away and it felt really good. Until we, yeah, <laughs> until we realized we had no money and no options.
<laughs> but you had your integrity because for somebody to say, hey, yes, we want to do the deal, but let's wait until you launch. And then they come back after you launch successfully and they devalue what you already put out there in the market. It's almost like a slap in the face because it's like, oh, no, we'll give you half of what we originally told you, even though you spent all your time, your resources and your energy to launch a successful product. And obviously you had the KPIs, the key performance indicators to back your successful launch. And I know it must have been hard to walk away because you're like, we need the money. But then you had your integrity, you had your brand, and you knew that you were successful. The only thing that you didn't have was the monetary assets. That's right. But we needed those monetary assets desperately. So it was really, really hard. And I will tell you, I learned two lessons there. So number one, the first time they went back on their word and did not fund us after we had negotiated the whole thing, run up a big legal bill, everything. And they said, no, we're going to wait two months until you launch. We should have walked away. We should have walked away then. Do you know, if you get a red flag, don't ignore it. You know, we thought, oh, this is normal. This is what they do. Don't ignore it. If they're not going to live up to their word, go or, you know, cut them early. Number two, we should have had other venture capital firms in the pipeline. Like I shouldn't have stopped talking to VCs once we engaged with them and it seemed like they were going to close the deal. So I, you know, I stopped going out to other people. I thought well, it's a done deal. We agreed, but it, it's never a done deal until the money's in the bank. So to continue the story, you know, it was one of the most difficult holiday seasons I've ever had. It was, we were so depressed, but you know what? I just kept going. Like you can't give up when you're faced with adversity. This is what it takes to be an indestructible entrepreneur. It doesn't take succeeding all the time. Like we, we were having you know, a, a horrible time. These things happen, but you gotta pick yourself up and keep going. So I kept going. Finally, I got through to this company. It was called Macro Media. It, was, it, had, it is now Adobe. So it was essentially Adobe. And they had just launched a product, their new product called Flash. And they asked us, the president asked me, can you get this to work with Flash? And I said, if you can fund our company, absolutely. Like we will get this working with Flash. He said, well, I can't fund your company. And I was like, oh, because we need a, a, a top tier venture capital firm in Silicon Valley to lead the round, but we can come on board once they leave. Another rule of thumb, people who won't lead are useless to you. You need lead investors. You don't need followers unless you can get them to introduce you to lead investors. That's the only use they are. So if they won't introduce you to anybody, they just want to follow, but they won't go out on that limb and actually make introductions, then you tell them I'm walking. So I, I said to him, like I was learning as I went, I said, well, who can you introduce us to? And he's like, okay, I can take you to some VC firms. I go, great. You know, you make those, if you make those introductions and they invest, you're in the deal. You know, basically if somebody is following if, if you tell them that if the investors you introduce us to invest, we'll cut you, in, we'll have you in the deal. But if they don't invest, all bets are off. We can't guarantee you'll be in the deal because you want to motivate them to make as many introductions as possible. So absolutely. He, Networking is equal to your net worth. Exactly. And you need to orchestrate it. You can't rely on just being a nice guy. Like you have to ask for it. So he made it, we had to wait literally till mid-January. So we were running on fumes. I was begging my employees to keep working for free. You know, we had uh, hosting fees and all these money going out. It was really, really hard and very stressful. Walks us in to one of the top VC firms on Sand Hill Road, which is in Silicon Valley, where all the big VC firms are. Sit down with them. And he comes to the meeting. I'm like, why is he coming to the meeting? He's the president of this big company. Why is he here? And I realized, ah, he's here to listen to what the VC says. If the VC doesn't like the deal and points out some reason it's not good, he's not going to make any more introductions. This is the trial run. So he's sitting there. I'm there. The pressure's on. If I know if I don't close this deal, like, it, you know, we're not going to have time to get the money in. You know, we're going to be, we're going to be out of business. So I give my pitch. I talk about it. I don't tell them we're, we're running on fumes. You know, you, you don't, you, you don't want to act desperate. So I act, you know, like everything's fine. We're doing a deal with MTV, blah, 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 blah. All we need is your money to grow. And at the end of my pitch, I look at him and he's stone-faced. Literally. Yeah. 
he 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 has no expression whatsoever. Um, so uh, I don't know what to make of it. And then he goes, excuse me. And he gets up and he leaves in the middle of my pitch, like, or at the end of my pitch, basically. And I sit there, I look at the president of, the, you know, this company who introduced me. He doesn't know what's going on. So I'm sitting there, oh my God, <laughs> it's over. Comes back in a few minutes later, sets down a piece of paper, and he goes, here's your term sheet. I want to give you not $5 million, but $7 million. More money than I asked for. I was like, oh my God, on my first pitch, I literally just met him, like just met him right there. So I was like, wow, why is he giving me, you know, why is he doing this? Like I pitched other VCs for a year and couldn't get a single one to come on board. What, what did I say? Clicked in my brain. I told him during that pitch, one thing that made him give me that term sheet. And that was, you see the, the president of Macromedia, which is now Adobe sitting over there? You are the first investor he's introduced us to. He promised to introduce us to other investors. I said that during my pitch. That in his brain meant, oh my God, if I let this startup walk out the door, they're gonna probably going to another meeting and they may get yeah. funded. Exactly. I, so the ball was now in your court, Captain Hall, because you put that message up front. And when you put that message up front, it planted a seed like, if I don't own in on this startup company, somebody else will. And they'll make that millions. And, you know, I could have had the opportunity because I was the first person. Yes. So I will tell you what motivates investors. Like, if you want to know, to be an indestructible entrepreneur and close deals. What motivates them is not your being nice. It's not just information. It, it, you know, it's not just your business model. What motivates them to actually close is they're looking at a lot of deals. It's hard for them to decide which deals to move on right now, which ones to wait and see what happens. And usually they'll wait. They'll say, oh, come back later. You know, you're a little too early or whatever, because they don't want to say no. They don't want to say yes. But what motivates them to make a decision is that their fear of, of losing the deal, of losing that deal, is greater than their fear of losing the money. So if you can get them more afraid that they, they're going to get cut out of a great deal, they act. And it's human psychology. Think about it. If you're walking in to a house that you, you know, you're searching for homes, you see the home that seems like a really good home, like in just the neighborhood you want. But the real estate agent tells you, ah, don't worry, this home will be available later. Come back, you know, you can look around. You'll go look around. You won't make the offer. But the real estate agent says, you know, if you walk out of here, somebody else is likely to come in here and take and, and get this home. Then you're motivated to close. So that's what motivated him. And then I started thinking, you know, I need the money in the bank yesterday. Like, I can't wait any longer. Like, we've waited way too long. So I need to get that money in now. And closing a venture deal, and by the time the money hits your bank account, it could be a month or two later. Because lawyers and all these things, they all go back and forth. It takes a lot of time. So I told him, I decided, again, here's another lesson for you. I took control of the negotiations. I wanted to set the timeline by which they close. Because the other VC firm, when I waited for them, they just kept me waiting two months and then they did nothing. So I wanted to know they're going to close on my terms and on my timeline. So I said to him, we don't need $7 million. He was surprised. I go, I only asked you for $5 million. And of course, I would have loved $7 million. But I was like, we don't need it. But I will tell you what, I will compromise with you. I will take $6 million more than I asked for if you can guarantee you can close this deal in two weeks. He turned to me and said, it's a deal. And literally, he lived up to his word. Two weeks later, we had the money in the bank. He rushed the lawyers and everything, and that saved our company. Awesome. And then one thing that I want to um, have you explain briefly is, why were you using the term angel investor? Is there a special reasoning behind it, or is that what you like to call them? So. There are different types of investors. So this was a venture capitalist. Early on, I was talking about angel investors in this story, like one of the angels coming in. The difference is angels come in very early. They usually come in before you have proof that your product works. Like you may be building your product, you may have a prototype, whatever. The angel will come in, or you may just have an idea. And the angel will come in at the beginning. That's why they're called angels and give you just enough money to get to the next step. 
in the case of this business, I was talking to angel investors. I couldn't close any because I was trying to figure out how to do this. But uh, what I did close was funding from MTV, our customer. They gave us the money to build the product. So that, in essence, was our angel funding. So usually you go through angel rounds, which are uh, they tend to be wealthy people who want who want to help startups and fund them. They may also be friends and family who chip in to help you go. Then you go to a seed round, which are either very large angels, very rich angels, or angel networks or or venture capital firms that come in at the seed round. Next, you go to the Series A. And what I'm talking about, I jump straight from bootstrapping to Series A. Series A is when you get like five million or more dollars, and it is. Uh, an institutional investor, a uh, uh, venture capital firm, you know, that's your series A. And then you go through many series, you keep getting funding, series B, C, D, E, whatever it takes until you get acquired, go public or go bankrupt. Thank you so much for explaining that because it, it definitely puts some context in there, especially for any listeners or viewers who may be in this predicament and they're not really sure where to go. And I also want you to give us some tips, Captain Hoff, on what makes somebody an indestructible entrepreneur? What are your top five tips? Number one thing that makes you indestructible is a positive mindset. Like you're going to get setbacks. It's going to be very difficult. Like I described to you, you, I could tell you my stories about the stress, but until you feel that stress, you don't know what it's like. <laughs> like everything's hanging on this. It's your dream. You put it all into it. So you, being indestructible is saying, look, I'm going to work as hard as I can to achieve my goal, but I am not going to let it uh, dictate my life and my feelings. You have to have control over who you are, like what you feel. Just because things are going wrong in your business, honestly, it's not the end of the world. Like, like I've had companies that have done extremely well. I've had companies that have done not well at all, like really. So in my life, I've learned that in the scheme of things in your entire life, you can look back on those worst case scenarios when they actually play out. And then, you know, you look back 10 years ago, what was that? Why was I so why did I think it mattered so much? And then all the little things that you do during your business, you know, that can really up your anxiety levels. You have to keep a perspective and say, look, well, I even remember this six months from now, you know, or a year from now. Honestly, 99% of those things, you won't even be able to recall that it happened. So why are you worrying about it? Like, just deal with these situations and deal with them calmly. And you really have to practice. Some people meditate, other people reflect. I like to take walks and think very deeply. What people do yoga, what people talk to their teams, to their friends, to their family. This really important, number one, for being indestructible. You have to know yourself. You have to treat yourself well, like love yourself. And you have to practice uh, keeping your mind clear and calm so that you make the best decisions possible. Number two, surround yourself with amazing people. Like if you want to be indestructible, no one person is indestructible. Like one person can be knocked down easily. A group of people, you know, it's much harder to knock them down. So when things get tough, like one of the reasons I hung in there with this startup was we had a team. I had co-founders. We were bonded. We were in this together. It wasn't me alone. So and don't just get ordinary co-founders, like whoever's available, you know, you know, your cousin, Jimmy, <laughs> you know, your, your, your roommate, because just because they happen to be your roommate, you want people who, yes, you bond with, yes, you communicate with well, but you want people who can add value, who really have the skill sets that complement yours, that can do things you can't do. Like we had amazing engineers in this startup. I couldn't have done it without them. Like they, they were just, they built that whole system, right? It, and they, and through all the problems we had, they always came through. I had an amazing uh, uh, friend who was uh, designed the whole system. You need these people, great designers, great technical people, great uh, marketing and salespeople, bring them on early and be generous, share the equity with them. You want to make it a win for all of you. So treat your, your team like your family. You start to, the family, you know, when you have that support, you're indestructible. The final thing is educate yourself. Like if you are going to be an indestructible entrepreneur, you always have to be learning. You cannot think you know it all because there's so much information out there. Like me, 
Like I literally read a, a new full length book, you know, every week. Right. And I still can't get through all the information I want to get through. You know, I'm filling my head with knowledge and ideas, you know, and I write my own books and, but honestly, every time I educate myself, I get a little better, always be improving yourself, you know, physically, mentally. And remember information is Basically, information is the raw material you will use to get the insights and, and the strategies and the know-how to actually succeed. So go out there and learn from great people, people who have done it before. Always be learning. That, those are some amazing tips. So I wrote down the top three um, tips. And Steve, please let the listeners and viewers know once again who you are, how they could connect with you on social media and your call to action and the other stuff they're eager to know. That's why they'll have to connect with you. Okay. So if you want to reach me, it's Steve Hoffman. Just go to founderspace.com, founderspace.com. I'm there. Uh, you can contact me there. We have tons of videos there. I have my own podcast there. We have lots of other, my books are there founderspace.com. If you want to get my latest book, just designed for startups, go to survivingastartup.com or search on Amazon. And if you want to reach out to me on social networks, I'm on almost every network. Uh, a great one is LinkedIn. You can go there and find me, Founderspace and Steve Hoffman, and we can chat. And there you have it, listeners and viewers of Gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp. You just heard Steve Hoffman, a.k.a. Captain Hoff, delivering some amazing tips so you can be an indestructible entrepreneur. All of his contact information will be in the show notes, so make sure you read, 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 and connect with him. Remember, you are a masterpiece. You are destined for greatness. Take actions today to secure a better future and what you don't know, surround yourself with people who do know and never be afraid to acquire new knowledge so you can sharpen your mental clarity, enhance your physical ability, and make sure you are driving yourself to the period where you're not just surviving, but you're thriving. And until we chat next time, peace, love, and lots of blessings. Go out and have yourself an amazing day. Carpe diem. Genesis, Ameris Kemp, and Steve Hoffman signing out. <laughs>